Well, here we are. Here we are. Happy first lecture conversation of the Feminist Art Field School. It is a pleasure to be in your company. Likewise. Uh, in service of our method, which is making explicit conversations between practitioners and makers and curators and artists and activists, I'm so looking forward to getting to know you better and differently through this conversation, because up until this point, I think we would both say that we've been in the bureaucratic side of field school preparation. How do we pay for things? How do we invite people? How do we involve our institutions? And hoping that this conversation can serve as a little bit more of a personal endpoint to our work and our interests and our obsessions. And perhaps I could throw to you the same question that we have offered to others, which is, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, sure. Um, uh, this is probably redundant, but my name is Michelle Jakes and uh, I guess first and foremost, I'm a curator. Um, I am somebody who came to curating through art history. So sometimes I call myself an art historian too, um, which often raises eyebrows. I'm not sure why art history has such a bad rap. Um, I find it a fun, fun space to flounder around in and maybe that's, maybe that's uh, a key thing that I'm, I'm a bit of a dilettante when it comes to art history. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm probably really badly trained uh, and therefore it's fun for me. Um, but after studying art history many, many years ago, um, I started working at the Art Gallery of Ontario almost immediately. And, um, it was a bit of a, a long, slow climb into curatorial. Um, these days, people uh, do curatorial studies degrees and get a lot of experience and end up in uh, curating jobs um, on a much shorter timeline than, than I did. I have worked in fundraising and human resources and um, uh, the volunteer divisions of public museums and um, have basically fulfilled every role that one can fulfill in a curatorial department um, from secretary as I was called back in the day at the AGO uh, to now um, chief curator and head of collections, exhibitions and collections at Ramey Modern. So um, I am a, a quite devoted public museum curator, I should say. I, I've certainly dabbled in um, a lot of artist run centers, working at the Center for Art Tapes in Halifax for a couple of years, but uh, also doing a lot of um, board and committee work at other artist-run centers. Um, I'm still on the board of uh, V-Tape, for instance. Um, so I think that uh, if I was going to describe what I do in museums, um, I would say that uh, I try to understand their structure um, and figure out how to um, sort of disrupt seems like, I don't know if I can claim that word, given that, given some of the people that we are speaking to in the Feminist Art Field School series, I'm not sure if I'm a disruptor. I'm like a, a subtle nag that um, tries to make the institution do things that it doesn't really want to do. I don't know why that metaphor just came to me, <laughs> but it is seeming very apt. That's what I do, um, which has been really fun for me because I think that there's a lot of potential in museums and um, 
as long as uh, you know we can move away from this tendency to sort of say, well, that's not how things are done here. Museums can do great things and be wonderful spaces for all kinds of people. I love this. And <laughs> the idea that you have self-identified as a subtle nag, I think, <laughs> belongs on a t-shirt somewhere. Maybe that is, you know, part of our Feminist Art Field School merch. I, would, course, I would love a merch arm of this enterprise. <laughs> And of course, one of the things that I love so much is that we are connected through a network of artists and we actually only came to know each other upon my arrival at the University of Victoria two years ago. And one of the things that I did immediately upon finding an apartment was find the art institutions. And it strikes me that you know, there's a way in which I tend to lead with my artist filmmaker identity, much more so than I lead with my professor identity. And um, if you identify as a, as a subtle nag, I identify as someone who is mm, only ever strategically aligning with institutions and trying to think of ways to move artistic and activist practice in and out of academia. And so for me, the field school is a really exciting opportunity to think across institutions. And, you know, just as you say, I think that there's so much good that can come of a museum if you ask a different set of questions. I feel the same way about academia. And I completely recognize the structures and limitations and also what might be possible when we shift the terms of what a classroom space could feel like or what collective collaborative learning can do and so one of the things that i feel so excited about doing together throughout these next 12 weeks is to be thinking out loud with artists who are actively engaged with pushing the boundaries of institutions broadly defined and thinking about art and aesthetic practice more broadly as one of the ways in which to promote, produce, problematize social change. Well, it's, it's so interesting to hear your response to my introduction of myself and understand how, how much sense this collaboration makes, because I do, I do think it's, it's quite funny um, to think about how we came together around this project. Um, you got your appointment to you, Vic, like a year before you actually started. So there was a year of our mutual acquaintances saying, Chase is moving to Victoria. You have to connect with Chase. And um, when we finally connected, it was as though we almost went directly into planning mode. <laughs> and you are easier to, um, you know, no, in a way, because of your work, um, than, than perhaps I am. So, um, I know about what you have made. I know your, your artist self, but, um, I'm just realizing I have, I don't even know what you, what you have been teaching before teaching the feminist art field school. <laughs> oh, what an, uh, what an unusual <laughs> question that I was not prepared for. Uh, so before arriving to the University of Victoria, I was on a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago. And part of that fellowship allowed me to teach these wild practice-based experimental classes where students put on large scale um, installation style exhibitions. When I was in graduate school, I taught many courses in the cinema and media studies department where I got my degree. And then upon my arrival here, I teach the core gender power and difference class. I teach a social media and pop culture class, some queer film, some queer and trans cultural production. And in some ways I could make an argument for the relationship between all of those courses, of course. But I am motivated to think across the lines of cinema and media studies and gender and sexuality studies. And, you know, depending on how you organize those disciplines, you get very different outcomes. And so I'm very 
enduringly curious about the role media plays in our lives and the ways in which media can control rights discourses and the ways in which media produces new identities and new community formations. And I came to thinking about feminism and feminist art critically in graduate school and was able to learn from many people who identify as scholar practitioners. So artists who have active practices, but who are also teaching. And for me, that was a real light bulb opportunity, which was to say, we don't have to be only thinking about work and reading about work, but rather we can be making work that does a kind of theoretical lifting that people only tend to assume is happening on the page. And I think that kind of practice-based relationship to theory and to reading is really exciting. And so I am thrilled to be learning from other artists with you in this field school about tips and tools and strategies for how to make that work. And so one of the things that I've really enjoyed in our preparation and planning is that, you know, we're co-curating the readings and offerings with the artists alongside their work, which is to say we get to read with them the work that inspires the things that they're thinking about and the things that they're making. And I'm wondering from a curatorial standpoint, what role does reading play in your practice? And there's a question that I didn't expect. <laughs> um, and well, to, to tie a bunch of things together, um, thinking back to my graduate school experience, uh, it was in the early 1990s. York was sort of in the throes of um, uh, a struggle between kind of um, the old school and the professors who were trying to introduce theoretical discourses to their teaching. And um, one of the things that happened out of that struggle was that it seemed that everybody, every professor, no matter how resistant they were to the idea, um, tacked two weeks of feminism onto the end of every syllabus. <laughs> and um, the amazing thing was that um, feminism was so much more practical the tacked on feminism was so much more practical and understandable and relatable than the the sort of true theory courses that we were taking um, because we wanted to be uh, cutting edge and on the forefront so i can remember sitting in a, a class with a, a derrida specialist and um, one of the artists in the class, I was studying art history, but this course was taken by um, uh, people doing their MFAs as well. One of the artists just like threw down her books and said, but what does this have to do with real life? And, um, you know, the interesting thing is that that professor could not come up with any proper articulation of why we had to uh, study Derrida in the way that we were studying Derrida. Like there was no attempt to make it relatable. Um, so I think that uh, reading does play a really important role in curatorial work, um, but it has been such a relief to sort of move into a space and I, I'm not saying that all curators work in this way but many do um, you know if if you work in a way where you're um, trying to relate to communities whether it's the communities of artists that you work with or the communities that comp um, compose the audiences that come to the museum um, you have to understand uh, basically um, how to translate all different kinds of ideas amongst people with different world views. And um, so 
there's a lot of reading around um, uh, those worldviews, but also reading that is about museology, I suppose, and um, uh, sort of understanding, learning how to, how to make those translations in the museum space. I love your Derrida anecdote, <laughs> because one of the things that you said was in the way that we were studying. So there's a way in which one could read Derrida and there could be explosive and incredible connections to people's archival pursuits, theoretical thinking, et cetera. But the way in which one approaches those texts is so key to their uptake and their translation. And, you know, I think that there's something very interesting to me about the fact that our original brainstorming about this field school was going to be an in-person incubator in a very condensed period of time. And I recognize the ways that that would have produced a different experience to what we are now collaboratively curating and organizing together, which extends. And I feel so excited because I think one of the things that's come out of our need to pivot online and our need to think safely together considering the geographic location of many of our guests is the fact that we get to have so many more conversations across a more extended time. And, you know, I wonder, one of the things that we have spent time talking about, I think, off the page and, and out of side of recorded Zooms is the role of institutional critique as a kind of through line in our thinking. And I'd be curious, what does institutional critique mean to you in your everyday? Um, it has it has meant many things over the many years that I've been working in institutions, working and going to school in institutions. Um, you know, uh, as a university student. Um, I was um, often a person sitting in the corner, like being annoyed because what was being taught to me was being so poorly taught. <laughs> I don't know if that was early institutional critique. It was, it was a, you know, a growing awareness that things could be better. Um, and uh, when I started, when I first started curating, I was a curatorial assistant at the Art Gallery of Ontario. That was my first curating job. So for the most part, I um, was in a support role on other people's projects. And the first time I was given the chance to curate something, uh, the artist that I worked with uh, is named Sally Mackay, and she teaches at McMaster University now. Um, and Sally made absolutely brilliant um, artists' books and multiples that you could buy at Art Metropole for as little as a dollar. Um, and we transformed this little gallery at the AGO uh, into a artist's multiple shop. Um, and I'm not even sure if we really did it kind of consciously. Sally was an artist whose work I liked. We liked each other. We did this project together, but um, we made the museum do things that it wasn't used to doing, um, you know selling work in a gallery space, um, showing work that was made on a photocopier. Um, like when some of Sally's flyers or little brochures ran out, I would make them on the photocopier upstairs. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think, I think that was, um, certainly an early 
sort of intuitive reaction to where I was working and what I was seeing in the museum and knowing that I wanted things to, to shift a little. And, and as I have grown and aged and sort of learned more about how the museum is complicit in much larger inequities and oppressions, um, the kinds of critiques that I'm interested in. And this is not to say that Sally Mackay is not a voice of profound critique of institutions because she is, but um, I think the, the, the kinds of critique that I have um, aimed to um, engage with and infuse in the museum um, are, are really in line with you know, inequities that I feel personally and within the communities that I, I belong to. So hence, uh, um, you know, a, a greater alignment with um, feminist issues, with anti-racist movements, with, you know, all, all kinds of uh, conversations that we have to have to, to really welcome everybody into the museum if that's what we say we're doing. And um, it's interesting to me that you started out by um, talking about, you know, maybe your, your clearer alignment with your role as an artist and um, the, the kind of more tenuous relationship to academia. Um, because in our conversations, um, you know, thinking about my, my early recognition of bad teaching, I have come to realize how deeply you think about how people learn in the space of um, a university classroom and, and how you you can structure things differently to create um, a more active and full of potential learning experience for people. I wonder if you could talk about how you think about teaching a little bit. Sure. I think that my investment in teaching is really a product of learning from those who have taught me, which is to say, I think that the only reason I've remained in academia is because I have had the opportunity to work with those who are really deeply invested in a choice and B, cross-disciplinary pursuits. And I think if I could isolate those two as anchoring methods in my teaching, I could probably speak for more than a minute, which is to say, you know, choice is such a key and fundamental part of learning. I think that it is a missed opportunity to over direct students, collaborators, interlocutors to predetermine what an assignment outcome should be. I think that we have all been products of school systems that have been you know, structured as racist and homophobic and transphobic environments that are committed to producing certain kinds of knowledge and expertise and thinking with those who are trying to decolonize institutions and modes of learning. I think that opening toward choice and change as necessary parts of the learning experience it has to be a foundational commitment. And you know, so often people will say, oh, but you have to evaluate, but you have to grade, but you have to do all these things. And I don't love grading. I don't love evaluating. And I also think there can be choice there. So what does it mean to create opportunities for students to evaluate themselves? To see? And I think that what's really exciting about a self-evaluative process is the chance to reckon with your own efforts and to say, yeah, sometimes it's just a B. Like, it's just not always going to be an A plus effort. And I feel the same way as a teacher. In no way do I imagine a world where I am an A plus lecturer every day of the week. It doesn't take into account my life. It doesn't take into account the ebbs and flows 
of one's process of learning. And so I think choice for me is also deeply related to a kind of cross disciplinary investment, which is to say, you know, disciplines are like identity categories, modes of categorization. And mo any mode of categorization is a mode of boundary making and exclusion. And so when we stay too neatly packaged within a lane or within a discipline or an identity, we're making choices to close off other modes of thinking and other modes of inquiry and other modes of disruption, which is to say the way in which you approach those questions is not the same depending on who you are and where you're coming from. And so trying to foreground and make visible all of those choices, I think opens up new pathways. But I very much identify as a new teacher and someone who's still continuing to learn and trying to pivot within an institutional context that I'm still learning. And I think that moving outside of the classroom space, moving on and off of screens, moving into cultural production and welcoming different forms of engagement are some of the strategies that feel most exciting to me at, at this stage. Um, I feel like uh, I should make reference to, I'm sitting in my office at Rainy Modern in Saskatoon, but um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria in response to, to what you've, you've just said, um, because I, I found it to be quite a remarkable space for a public museum. And I can remember when I, um, I did my interview, the director saying to me, you know, this is, this is a museum where we welcome failure. And then he like second guessed himself and he, and he said, I mean, not that we want to fail, but it's okay if you do. Um, and uh, I don't think that the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria fails at a lot of things, but there is um, a remarkable willingness to enter into um, projects that actually make no sense within the context of an art museum. <laughs> um, you know, they will do things because they're good for artists or they're good for communities or they allow them to explore interesting questions. Um, and somehow the institution has um, sort of separated it, itself from this sort of hamster wheel that museums can get on as just producers of cultural product. Um, so I'm really interested to see how this um, program, the Feminist Art Field School, translates into the space of uh, the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria's website and you know, what, what happens when um, the space and procedures of museum education intersect with university education, particularly when we're working with somebody who is thinking through the potentials and challenges of, of education in the way that you are. I love that. And it feels to me related to a conversation that we had with Sean Lee in service of the field school when he said that Tangled Arts has a clause in their contract called a care clause. And it makes me wonder what something like that in the context of a field school could be, you know, how can we take care of each other differently? What does a relationship across institutions and across contexts allow us to imagine? And, you know, perhaps it's not a care clause, we won't borrow it so directly, but maybe there's something that we can think about together over the next 12 weeks and, and, and return to to the possibility that there's something else that's going to happen here that we can not yet predict. Amazing. And I, that makes me think all the way back to my first year of undergrad when I was a biochemistry major with uh, uh, sites set on going to medical school. And I ended up in 
you know, this, this class of people who were so competitive, somebody, um, somebody sabotaged my chemistry experiment in the second semester of first year. And I thought, this is not for me at all. (laughs) And uh, not, not that there was anything as explicit as a care clause in First, I transferred into psychology and then art history, but um, it was subtly there that people interacted in a very different way than they they did in those pre-med spaces. <laughs> I love it. And I think, you know, there is something to be said for imagining a world together and a container of the field school and looking back on it and realizing that something different occurred there. And I think part of that is because we are only two bodies in what will be a room of 50 plus who can co-create the contours of the next 12 weeks. Fantastic. Thanks for joining me on the journey. (laughs) (laughs) It is my absolute pleasure to be here.